What's up guys, today in this video, we're gonna talk about seven easy steps for planning an out-of-state deer hunting trip. Oftentimes, we feel bound by our geographic location. We have roots, but we're not trees. We can get up and go anywhere in the world, and that's why I made it a goal starting three or four years ago that every single season, I wanna take at least one out-of-state hunting trip. And I wanna share all the things that I've learned with you today, so stay tuned. If you like hunting videos, tips, and gear reviews, like this video and subscribe to my channel. The first step to planning an out-of-state hunting trip is to simply decide, make the decision to do so. Maybe years of frustration are driving you to do something different. Maybe that adventure sense is tingling and you wanna see what else is out there. Or maybe you're realizing you're not getting any younger and you've yet to bag that buck of a lifetime. Whatever your motivation is, the first step is to simply decide and then put the rest of the steps into action. The second step, and one of the most critical of them all, is to dive into the research. Here you have a lot of things to consider. Planning a hunt is a lot like buying a house. You create your criteria, you figure out what you want, what you don't want, and then you're able to use the process of elimination to nail down exactly where you wanna go. The first thing that I like to figure out is what time of the season I wanna plan this hunt around. The goal of my very first out-of-state trip was to simply extend the time I had to hunt that year. Our normal season here in Michigan runs from October 1st to December 31st, so I picked a state that allowed me to begin hunting in September. Maybe you prefer to hunt the first few days in November and increase your odds of catching a cruising buck during the rut. Totally up to you. The first thing you gotta figure out is when because a lot of times season dates will dictate which states you're allowed to hunt. The next thing that you need to figure out is what type of terrain do you wanna hunt? Do you want it to be similar to your home state so there's less of a learning curve and already more familiar to you? Do you want it to be open country like the plain states out west so that way you can get eyes on a lot more animals even though there might be less cover? Do you wanna be in the hill country like Southern Ohio? Each area has a time and place and you have to do the research to figure out what makes sense for you, what type of hunt you wanna go on and by doing so, you're gonna drastically start reducing the number of states that fit the criteria you're looking for and help you narrow it down to the exact one. By the time you've figured out what time of season you wanna hunt, what type of train you wanna hunt, and maybe considering things such as how far are you willing to drive, hopefully you've greatly reduced the number of states that still fit the ticket and you can start to dive into the more specific things such as trophy potential. So when evaluating a specific state or even a state as a whole, I like to refer to the Pope and Young record book. North America Whitetail actually put together heat maps of specific counties within most of the popular hunting states that show the concentration of Pope and Young entries. Granted, a lot of people probably don't even bother to take the time to submit their bucks into the Pope and Young, but it does give you a pretty good baseline and lets you know where the trophy areas are. After further narrowing your focus, the next thing to consider is how much public access there is to hunt. I prefer to focus on areas that are far away from metropolitan areas that are big blocks of unbroken timber because that gives you lots of room to work with, lots of room to roam, areas to out hike other hunters, but also consider that smaller pieces might be overlooked and still offer a lot of great hunting as well. The last part of step two and a piece that 99% of hunters aren't willing to do is to call the DNR officers and the local wildlife biologists. These people live and breathe in those areas and they can tell you things such as if there's crops planted on public, what the deer density is, how the hunting pressure is, if there's good bucks in the area, and on and on and on. So I would make sure to have a list of questions ready to go and be able to further evaluate these specific hunting areas. When I was planning a hunt in Missouri, the wildlife biologist that focused on the specific piece of public that I was interested in, he actually emailed me a map during the summertime of where all the crops were planted, what was planted, so I knew where there was gonna be standing corn, where there was gonna be beans, and while I was preparing for my hunt in the fall, I could use all of this information to help plan, help cyber scout and make decisions, so I had a game plan when I got there in the fall. So now we've made the decision that we're making this thing happen, we've done the research, we've selected a very specific area, the third step is to budget. The five main expenses on a hunting trip are travel, lodging, tags, food, and gear. And in almost all cases, there's a lot of ways to offset the cost to make it more affordable. For travel and lodging, generally, the more people you have with you, the cheaper those are going to be. If you're able to carpool and have two or three people ride in a truck together, that's gonna be a lot cheaper than one person driving by themselves. There's a lot of options for lodging. Obviously, on the cheap end of the spectrum, you can do any sort of camping, whether you're sleeping in your truck, tent camping, or pulling a camper with you. If you need more amenities, generally, you can find a cheap hotel or motel for 40 or 50 bucks a night in some of these rural areas. 
They're not going to be very nice. They might be a little gross, but you just make do because that's what you got to do to, to do this on a budget. The other option I really like to do is to do like an Airbnb or a VRBO. Basically, you're renting somebody's house, and if you got a good group of people, whether it's three or four people um, or a bigger group, depending on, on the size of the house, for a relatively small amount of money, you guys can have access to an entire house, have a kitchen, bathroom, laundry, all the things that you might need for a longer trip. Um, I definitely prefer that option. And a lot of times you can just search on the map, try to pick some target areas and be able to find lodging accordingly. So tags is a topic I should have brought up in the research section. Research section, that's a tongue twister. But a lot of states do work off of a lottery system. So you have to have a certain amount of points in order to draw a tag. So whether it's a year or two or four or five years, like the case of Iowa, but those tags generally are gonna be more expensive when you finally do get them, but your trophy potential and your odds are probably gonna be a lot higher because it is a lot more exclusive. But there are plenty of states that have over-the-counter tags that are relatively cheap. So definitely something to factor in. And if you're on a budget, if you're, if you're only willing to spend a certain amount or only able to spend a certain amount on a hunt, tag price is something that you need to consider. If you're dead set on going to a specific area in a specific state, there's not much you can do about the tag price. Now, when it comes to food, that's a category you can save a ton of money. I recommend preparing full meals such as chili or soups and then freezing them in gallon sized bags. And that way you can just bring a slow cooker with you, throw it in the crock pot, don't have to worry about anything. You got meals ready to go for really, really cheap. The other thing I do to save a lot of money is eat a lot of peanut butter and jellies when I'm actually out hunting. So in the mornings before I go out, depending on what I'm doing, I'll make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the day along with other snacks, trail mix and things like that pack all of my meals ahead of time so that way when I'm out there in the field, I don't have to worry about going to get food or stopping to cook something and I'm not tempted to run into town, spend unnecessary money and unnecessary time to go eat at a restaurant or pick up fast food or something like that. The last of the main five budget categories is your hunting gear. And where I find myself spending the most money in this category is when I'm planning a trip that's drastically different than what I'm used to in Michigan. For instance, when I was planning a mule deer hunt out west in the open country, I made sure to invest in a good tripod and spotting scope as well as good binoculars because optics are key. If you're doing something similar to the style of hunting you're used to, more than likely you probably have enough gear to be effective but make sure you got a good pair of boots that are well broken in ahead of the hunt. Make sure you have one good mobile setup, whether it is a stand and sticks, a saddle and sticks, a climber stand, maybe you just like hunting from the ground, completely up to you, but just make sure you have one good mobile setup. Then outside of that, you probably already have everything that you need. The fourth step to planning an out-of-state hunt is to cyber scout. By now you've done your research, you've selected a general area, you've talked to the biologist, you've talked to the DNR officers, you know where there's good deer density, low hunter pressure, good trophy quality, and now it's time to really dive in and pick out specific spots on the map that you wanna to target to hunt. I don't wanna to go too far down the rabbit hole of cyber scouting, but things that I like to consider when I'm cyber scouting are where are the access points? Where are the other hunters gonna be? Is there water or other terrain features that might make it difficult to get to certain areas within that wildlife area that I can get to and will probably cut out a lot of the competition? Am I going deer in the rut? I'm gonna mark specific terrain funnels and things that are gonna concentrate deer activity so that way I can get in, catch a cruising buck, scent check in a doe bedding area. Maybe I'm planning an early season hunt and really wanna focus on the water sources because I know water is gonna be a limited resource. And when it's hot out, it could be a good way to target bucks. Or maybe you're hunting hill country and with a predominant wind and a good topo map, a lot of times you can estimate the bedding and deer travel patterns based off of just the maps. The better you get at cyber scouting, the more effective your actual scouting and actual hunting will be when you get there. Super important to spend the time studying the maps, getting familiar with these areas you plan to hunt, and let your browser do a lot of the work for you instead of having to actually walk all these areas to get familiar for the first time you should have a pretty good idea of what you're getting yourself into by the time you actually get to where you're gonna hunt. Step five, and you probably guessed it already, is to get boots on the ground and go scouting. Depending on where you live in relationship to where you're trying to plan a hunt, especially if you have limited time off, it might be unrealistic to make a separate trip ahead of time, but if you can, you're gonna be light years ahead of somebody that just shows up on day one. I try to plan all of my scouting trips between the end of last year's seasons and before spring green up because all the deer sign is still there. There's no leaves covering scrapes that were opened up during the fall. You can see the rubs, you can see tracks if there's snow, you can see the beds in the snow potentially. If you're targeting an area that doesn't have snow, that's just fine too. You can still see all of that same sign. Another cool thing about scouting this time of year is a lot of times you can find sheds. So right away without any camera intel, you can get an idea of what caliber of bucks are in the area and get some souvenirs to take home because who doesn't love having sheds sitting around the house? We'll set these over here. 
If you are unable to take a separate scouting trip ahead of time, I do strongly recommend that you block off the first couple days to strictly scout or at least spend half of those days scouting and half of those days hunting. I do understand how difficult it can be to sacrifice hunting time for scouting, but trust me, you'd much rather be in the right areas for just a couple days than be in the wrong areas for the whole trip. This is where you validate all of your cyber scouting. You should have points of interest marked. You should have potential bedding area, potential food sources even. You should have a lot of this stuff laid out already so you don't have to scout the entire property. But you should have all these points marked out. So instead of having to scout the entire property, you should be able to be efficient, get in, hit those spots, validate that what you thought is true or not true. Sometimes you gotta make a plan B, plan C, plan D, but hopefully you did the cyber scouting and the preparation work to allow you to be able to do that efficiently. I'll throw in a disclaimer here. Just because you make an off-season scouting trip doesn't mean you're not gonna have to scout when you get there. Things change, food sources change, the time of the year changes, things rotate, so you have to be able to adapt on the fly so both cyber scouting and boots on the ground scouting are in constant play at all times of the year, whether you're planning for a trip or you're actually there on the hunt, you're gonna be doing a lot of scouting. Step six is to gear up. At this point in the process, you've done the research, you've done the scouting, you know exactly where you're going to hunt, who you're going to hunt with, what time of the year you're going to go, and now it's time to get your gear in tip top shape. For sticks and tree stands, I recommend stealth stripping everything you possibly can to eliminate any metal to metal contact, making everything super quiet. This is the time to make sure your boots are waterproofed. All of the equipment that you need is in tip top shape and ready to go. If you need recommendations on gear, I'll put my full gear list down below, but if you do have additional questions, feel free to drop me a comment and I'll make sure to reply. This is also the point in time where you should probably practice your system. If you just switch to a saddle or switch to a specific tree stand, got new climbing sticks, got a new climbing method, you wanna work out all of the kinks before you go in for your first hunt because there's nothing worse than getting to your tree, trying to set up and realize you forgot something, realize you're missing something, realize that your system just doesn't work and now you're stuck with a faulty system. Take the time to practice in your backyard, go up the tree, down the tree, Create a process. You should know where everything in your pack goes. Everything should have a designated spot because when you hit the ground in this new state, you wanna be as deadly, as quiet, and as efficient as possible. The seventh and final step to this whole thing is to execute, to actually go on the hunt. Take all the time, the research, the scouting, all the work and time you put into this thing and actually reap the benefit and hopefully have that hunt of a lifetime. Well, the goal on all of these trips is to fill a tag. Don't lose sight of the entire journey. All the skills you must develop, all the time you invested, Everything that you gain to make these trips happen is an experience in themselves and worth it in themselves. And there's nothing more fulfilling than driving across the country with good family, good friends, getting the job done and having a blast in deer camp. With that said, if you're planning an out-of-state trip for next year and you have questions, drop me a comment below. I'll make sure to answer every single one of them. These trips are super rewarding. I wanna go on these trips for as long as I possibly can. I think when I'm old and gray, I'm gonna be very grateful and very thankful that I took the time to go on these different adventures, experience different parts of the country, and especially, create memories with people that I care about the most. With that said, thank you guys so much. Stay tuned, there's gonna be a new video dropping every single week. So again, if you like this kind of content, if you like hunting videos, if you like product reviews, if you like hunting tips and strategies, make sure you subscribe, hit that little notification bell, and I'll see you guys next week.